the book podcast from Port Moody Public Library. I'm your host today, Al, and I'm joined by my book friends, Emma, Kareen, Sadie, and Virginia. So we all have our favorite books, the ones we love to tell everyone about that we recommend without any reservation. But what about those books that, while we love them, we feel a little twinge of guilt? shame when it comes to recommending them to others well today we are saying no to shame we are embracing the cringe and we are recommending some of our guilty pleasure reads i am looking forward to finding out what kind of books my book friends are going to tell us about today so let's start with our newest member emma emma what kind of guilty pleasure do you have for us today so as we learned last week, my reading taste tends to lean towards, as Kareen so kindly put it, stories that highlight the warrior bonds of men. Um, I read a lot of shonen manga that tends to have a lot of fighting in it, and the novels that I'm drawn to are usually philosophical or psychological and pretty dark in their content. Um, but every now and then, I do get a craving for a cheesy and lighthearted romance read as a little treat. Um, and my favorite romances tend to be the ones that are queer romances. So for this week's pick, I chose a young adult sapphic romance that I've been meaning to read since I first heard about it. Um, this book was published in May 2023, and it has sort of unusual beginnings to it. First, it was a hit pop song, and then it turned into a viral music video. And now, eight years after the song's initial release, it's been turned into a best-selling young adult novel. Um, the book is Girls Like Girls by the author Haley Kiyoko, who is also an American singer and songwriter. Now, this book follows the same characters from Kyoko's music video, two 17-year-old girls named Coley and Sonia. Coley has just arrived in small-town Oregon from San Diego, and we learn pretty early on in the story that she's very reluctant to be there in her new town. Um, she was forced to move in with her absent father following a sudden and tragic loss of her mom, and for the duration of the story, Coley carries a sadness with her that she doesn't feel like she truly belongs in her new home and that the people who love her will eventually abandon her, as she feels both of her parents did. Coley takes her bike out to explore her new town and to escape the awkwardness of living with a father that she doesn't really know, when she's nearly hit by a reckless minivan in a 7-Eleven parking lot. Out of the minivan pops Trenton, a douchebag archetype that we've seen in many teenage romances before, and Sonia. Coley describes Sonia as the kind of pretty that's undeniable. She's beautiful and popular, and everyone follows her lead wherever she goes. This meet-cute turns into an afternoon of Coley hanging out with Sonia's friends, which turns into half a summer of Coley just hanging out with Sonia. They shoplift liquor and get drunk on forested train tracks, sharing secrets with one another that they would never share with anyone else. For weeks, they have a long will-they-won't-they they of pining, walking the fine line between being just friends and being more than friends. The whole time, Coley is pretty confident that her feelings for Sonia are romantic. It's pretty clear that she knows she likes girls. Sonia, on the other hand, struggles with accepting that her feelings for Coley may be stronger than she initially expected. She faces a lot of pressure from her mother to be her best, whether it's in school or at dance competitions, and the building pressure to constantly live up to others' expectations hinders her from being her true, authentic self, someone who is worthy of love from another girl. Other characters in the book include a cast of familiar faces from coming-of-age romances, a mean and jealous popular girl, an unexpected ally, a chill stoner type who acts as a voice of reason, and parents who are unusually lax about curfews. There's also Trenton, the aforementioned douchebag, whose entire role seems to be to piss off the protagonists in any way that he can. Many of these characters' arcs are predictable and honestly a little bit unfinished at the end, but they act as a decent supporting cast to Coley and Sonia's love story. While this book was a little cheesy and predictable at times, I did enjoy it, and I think it would have a lot of appeal to teens and young adults who are seeking out, seeking out a realistic coming-of-age lesbian romance, especially one written by a lesbian. The story takes place in 2006, which gives it a bit of a nostalgic feel, 
the music references and the usage of AIM messaging were a fun little throwback that helped in creating a rich world within the story. While the story itself and the writing weren't necessarily groundbreaking, I was reminding myself often throughout reading it that Kyoko is a singer-songwriter first and an author second. Um, I have to give Kyoko credit for bringing new life to characters that she initially created for a music video eight years ago. Those who remember the Girls Like Girls video will see the same plot points happen throughout the book. Coley riding her bike a lot, the girls sharing cigarettes at parties, and an unusually violent fight in a backyard pool for the honor of a girl. Um, some of these plot points are a little overly dramatic, and some of the characters a little too obnoxious for my taste, but they suit the genre of young adult coming-of-age stories, so they're not out of place here. Overall, Girls Like Girls makes for a quick and lighthearted read for anyone looking for a coming-of-age lesbian romance with emotional depth and characters to root for. That sounds like a fun read. I may have to pick it up. Um, next, I think we're going to go to Virginia. Virginia, what have you got for us today? Yeah, okay. Um, so first of all, like, you should never feel guilty about reading. You should be proud of whatever you choose to read, and we are proud of you too. But I guess guilty pleasures to me, I'm assuming, are books that you're embarrassed to admit that you're reading, I guess. So keep this definition in mind <laughs> as I explain why I'm talking about my book today. So how this all begins, how I sort of started this obsession with this type of books, begins at a library conference many, many years ago. It was a jam-packed auditorium, I remember, full of librarians who were also super interested in the topic and are looking for some sort of enlightenment. The session presented by two librarians is called Getting Things Done. And... It's a bunch of people all sitting there, all overwhelmed by all the things that we have to do every day, you know, seeing our list get longer and longer and trying to figure out how we can get ourselves organized and be more productive. The session specifically is on a specific methodology called Getting Things Done, which is GTD. Um, anyone who have ever read any productivity article will be familiar with this acronym. And I remember like getting home, have to listen to this, all fire up to implement this GTD business, you know, get my label maker, get my folder, set up my in basket and do all that stuff. And it sort of started this never ending research into all the methodologies that are supposed to help me out from GTD to Atomic Habits, which I think I talk about on the New Year episode, I think. To like eating the frog, the Eisenhower matrix, the Kaizen Toyota method, time boxing, bullet journal method, which has nothing to do with washi tape or markers. I have read them all. I have listened to all the podcasts. I have studied all the articles. I have downloaded all the latest apps that are supposed to help you organize your life, all in the hopes that I can actually get everything on my to-do list done and cross off every single item. Of course, very aware that I'm actually not doing any work, which I could be spending time doing the work, but I'm just finding better ways to make sure that I get work done. Hence, kind of guilty pleasure, I guess. So for today, I kind of read a, um, I guess, a, a recent bestseller in this sort of productivity field. And really, I think it's a book that Miss Corrine, I don't know if you actually end up finishing it, but uh, we did talk about it. It is 4,000 Weeks. Time Management for Mortals by Oliver Berkman. Now, when I first saw the book, especially the subtitle, Time Management for Mortals, I was kind of interpreting it as, okay, so this is the book that's kind of be like, like a knock at all the other like systems because everybody else expect you to like have discipline, have willpower to do this. But oh, no, nah, no, we are going to talk about very easy, simple, practical tips that anyone can implement, just like all of us humans, mere mortals can deal with it. Well, that is not what Oliver Berkman means at all. He's actually using that word very literally because he is telling us, his opening statement is that you and I are going to die one day. That our lifespans on this planet are so short, give or take 4,000 weeks. And then he went on to explain all the issues that we're having, all the worries, all the anxieties, like us getting distracted by social media, us picking up our phones like a thousand times a day. You know, we procrastinating, us not willing to commit a relationship because we feel like we are settling. 
all of this is caused by our refusal to accept this fact that we are going to die, that our life is limited and finite, which is a very core concept in Stoic philosophy. Remember that you will die. And we think somehow we have been taught to think that we matter in the grand scheme of things, that somehow everything that we do makes a difference to the universe. And we forget our what he called cosmic insignificance. Even Steve Jobs, who created this phone thing, is still teeny tiny in the eyes of the universe. Nobody cares. And somehow we have been tricked by every productivity system out there and this general thinking in the society that we can do it all, whether it is work, whether it is personal, that there is a way that you can feel not overwhelmed, that there is a way to get all the stuff done as long as you follow whatever system that they have for you. That is all doable. It's just that you may not be disciplined enough. You just don't have enough willpower. And that there is a way that you can meet all the expectations that people have for you, that society has for you, and that you yourself have of you. And one of the analogies that he included in the book is this parable about this teacher who brings one day brings into his class a jar, a bunch of like big rocks, a bunch of smaller rocks and some sand. And he told his students, okay, try to fit everything into the jar. And so the students start putting in like, you know, pouring in the sand, putting in these tiny little rocks. And then they want to try to put the big rocks in, but not realizing the jar is already full. There's no space for these big, giant, humongous rocks. And they all look at the teacher for help. And the teacher's just like, oh, you silly grasshoppers. What you have to do is to put in those big rocks first. Then when you pour the sand in, when you put in those little rocks, it will fit around all the gaps. And that's how you put everything in. And the moral of the story is that you sh should always do the most important thing first, the whole eating the frog business. Well, Bergman is telling you that that's all a lie. The teacher is not being truthful because life is not made up of six, seven big rocks that you choose from. Life is full of possibilities. There are six million big humongous rocks waiting for you to fit into that jar. And there are so many things that you're able to do. It's a ridiculous premise that you think that you could handle this. And for whatever reason, we believe that we get to control the future, that we manage time, we control time, that we have time. And as Corinne and I have discovered this year specifically, that planning, planning matters? That everything is going to happen exactly like you want as long as you plan for it? I don't think so. And not only do we are trained to think that, we also are trained to think that everything that we do has to have a point. That is all a means to this future happy me that is somehow going to turn up. As he said, the marathon runner that cannot see how just a regular run is good enough because to them, Every single thing has to have a use, that we're always working towards this bright future. But we don't, because future is going to happen whether you like it or not. It doesn't matter what you do, because that is just, it's not in your control, you know, and it's nothing to do with willpower or discipline or anything like that. Now, it might sound like a very grim and morbid kind of outlook in life, but, you know, Bergman is telling you that, no, you should feel liberated in some way because knowing, acknowledging that your life is insignificant, that, you know, makes you feel like, you know what, I don't have to strive to be this an absolutely unrealistic version of yourself. As he said, there might be nothing more you need to do to justify your existence. Recognize that you have this one life and do what you want to do and, you know, don't do what you don't want to do. Um, and remember that, you know, you're going on a hike one day. Yeah, the hike has no purpose, has no reason. But remember that this might be the last time that you're going on a hike. So enjoy it. Participate in fully in this hike. Find joy, as he said, not in trying to do a thousand different things, but plunging more deeply into the life that you already have. Experience the life that you have right now with twice the intensity. And once we embrace this truth, 
we can get around to doing things, you know, as and one of my favorite lines that he said is, you can get around to doing things, making life more luminous for the rest of us by doing whatever magnificent task or weird little thing it was that you came here for. Now, what does that all mean? Well, after reading the book uh, recently, I, my husband is not listening to this episode, so that's fine. Uh, but like, I decided well, he was going to go and meet up with some high school friends of his that he hasn't seen since the pandemic. And usually we always go to gatherings together because, you know, that's what we do. Um, but I'm just like, you know what? No, I'm not going. I am just not going to go because not only is that like it's been an exhausting year. I'm just like, no, I'm too stressed to do this. But also like gatherings is scary. Small talk. I think it's just as scary as spiders in my mind. So like, this is not something I can do. So I'm just like, you know what now? So like I went home and then like I went out to have pho that night and I read a book. It was beautiful. It was so good. Um, so yeah, so like, you know, again, 4,000 weeks, you know, got to make use of that. Um, and converse, like, you know, on the other hand, you know, making sure I spend time with those people that I want to spend time with, which I did also, you know. And as he said, next time you have this impulse to check in on a friend or maybe to like send an email telling people that like they did a really good job, do it right away because a hastily crafted, like a hastily written email is much better than a beautifully crafted, well composed email that you know you will never send because you're waiting for that right moment. So just do it. So, yeah, instead of a productivity book, instead of getting like 10 tips on how I can manage my time, I guess I end up getting like a more like a philosophy book, you know, that he sort of draws on the wisdom of all these other fingers to make sure that we remember that we are going to die. So be present in the present. So that is 4,000 Weeks Time Management for Mortals by Oliver Berkman. I have to say that sounds like it might be one of the first self-help books that has actually appealed to me as something that I might enjoy. Um, gave me very uh, big, tell me what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life vibes. Um, yeah, that is something I may have to check out. So thank you, Virginia. Um, I love that your guilty pleasure is time management books. <laughs> So moving on, I think let's go to our existential question for the episode. So outside of books, what is one guilty pleasure that you have? I feel no guilt about anything. Nothing. Nothing. As you said, Al, one precious life. And so I live it fully, loving the things that I love and consequently hating the things that I hate. Um, but I think if I had to choose kind of one overwhelming thing, everyone knows what I'm going to say here. Everyone knows that I'm going to say uh, my one guilty pleasure, of which I feel absolutely no guilt or shame about a uh, card carrying member of the BTS army. Yes, there is an actual card that you can put in your wallet just in case there's a like emergency. Um, but yeah, that's my guilty pleasure in the way that it is. I'm going to define it as something that is not necessarily productive, but brings me great joy and happiness and purpose in my life, even though people from the art outside might not see it or acknowledge it. You can go next. Um, something that I definitely used to feel guilty about that I've We're done the work to unlearn that shame is um, my love for anime and my love for manga. I remember back in high school, I would get a lot of... Uh, a lot of shade from friends of mine are like, oh, you like anime? That's so weird. And so I used to keep it hidden to myself, but now I wear it on my sleeve. I have a bunch of anime tattoos. Like everyone who meets me knows that I love anime. So I wouldn't say I'm guilty about that. The TV shows that I watch that I do absolutely feel guilt and shame for are bad reality television. I am just such a sucker for bad reality. I love Love Island. I love the stupid, like too hot to handle shows that they put on Netflix. I just think it's so funny. Um, and if I want to turn my brain off and put on something that'll make me laugh and make me feel better about myself and better about my own life, those are the things that I tend to turn to. Um, and they're great. And I will like, I feel a little bit of shame for watching them, but who cares? They bring me so much joy that I don't care. Yeah, I was gonna say, I feel like everybody knows my, my love for 90 Day Fiance. So that's probably... <laughs> probably my guilty pleasure and, I, and I'm clearly not that guilty about it because I, I have talked about it on this podcast numerous times before 
Um, yeah. And then again, another one, I don't know if we consider it guilty though, is any baking show ever created and Hallmark Christmas movies. I love a good Hallmark Christmas movie. I'm going to, yep. Yeah, that one actually, that might be the biggest one. Cause I have denied that for a very, very long time. And I don't know if I can watch them from when they start showing them back in October until the end of the Christmas season. That's a bit much. Um, but, but yeah, no, I do. I, I love a good Hallmark Christmas movie. They're so predictable and they're just so great. I feel like it would be the same thing. Just any random cooking show that is available on TV, doesn't even matter what it is, I will be watching. Um, and I guess like, you know, same thing with Korean. Like, I mean, like, I, I don't any of us really do feel guilty about any of this, but, um, co you know, spending all my money on Squishmallows, probably I should feel a little guilty about it, but I don't because, you know, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, so stuff like that, I guess. Yeah, like... Like you said, Virginia, the uh, the actual guilt is probably not so present in this. It's just the phrase guilty pleasures. But for me, it's it's a toss up um, for what I want to say. Um, one is my favorite sort of if I've had a bad day and I want to watch a TV show that will just make my mind melt and not have to think too much. I love the A-Team, the TV show from the 80s. Every single episode follows the exact same formula. The A team is hired by someone who has a problem. Face is like, but we need money. Uh, they do the problem. At about the 40 minute mark of the episode, they build something. They solve the problem. They don't get paid. Or if they do get paid, they get paid in something weird like watermelons. The story continues. It's great. It's perfect. And the other thing that I is sort of a guilty pleasure for me is perfume. I collect perfume um i love it i like buy stuff from indie perfume makers far too often i have a collection of more than i would care to admit um but i just really like smelling nice and i like having different scents for different uh moods so that is my other guilty pleasure <laughs> All right, so let's move on back to our guilty pleasure books. Sadie, what do you have for us today? All right, so I, I actually debated which guilty pleasure series I was going to talk about because I do have a couple. Um, however, I do have a vague recollection of talking about one of them on this podcast before, even though I could not find a record of that anywhere. I don't know these memories in my mind. I don't know if I can trust them anymore. Um, but anyways, this series that I am going to talk about is probably the one that I feel guiltier about maybe um yeah so i'm going to preface this by saying that i absolutely hate the name of this series and i think that is one of the reasons why i don't like telling people that i read this series because i just i just don't like their name i just don't like it um that is also has ridiculous plots and romance um which is maybe another reason why i don't tell people i read this series however I absolutely devoured all nine books in this series, as well as continued to read the author for many, many years afterwards. So I think there is something that is engaging for me in this series. Okay. So this is, oh dear, it disappeared. Um, so this is, the series is called The Freak House Series. And more specifically, right? It's, yeah, it's not great. Uh, more specifically, the first Freak House series. And the book is called The Wrong Girl. And it's by C.J. Archer. So there are three Freak House series, three, three Freak House trilogies. Um, and they all kind of take place in the same uh, time period. They all follow the same kind of group of characters, but each telling a different story. Uh, so this series starts with The Wrong Girl. And it starts in the year 1888. Hannah Smith is 18 years old. And she lives at Windermere Manor, the home of Lord and Lady Wade and their daughter, Lady Violet. Now, more specifically, she lives in the attic of Windermere Manor. And she has lived in the attic of Windermere Manor for the last 15 years. And it's really not as bad as it sounds. The attic is big and open, and she does live there with her best friend, Violet. And the two of them pretty much have the run of the whole attic, and they're pretty much given anything that they want. They have all the finest books and tutors. They have music and embroidery and sewing, pretty much anything a young lady 
in the 19th century could ever hope to want. Except, of course, they aren't allowed to leave. Now, Hannah knows that in actuality, she's very lucky. She's the orphan daughter of servants, and she's read enough Dickens to know that orphans don't usually end up living in a manor house, sharing a room with the daughter of a lord. Besides, her and Vi are as close as sisters, and so even if Hannah had somewhere else to go or something else to do, she would never dream of leaving Vi alone, especially not with Vi's affliction. Hannah has a tendency to fall asleep at random times. She has narcolepsy. And she goes kind of into an almost comatose state. However, Vi has a tendency to set things on fire. The episodes that Vi and Hannah have always coincide. Vi claims that her fear for when Hannah loses consciousness causes her to inadvertently light things on fire. And by the time that Hannah comes to and her head stops spinning, the fires have been put out. But the girl's strict governess, Miss Levine, has already arrived to scold them and to demand that Hannah clean up whatever mess was made by their episodes. Miss Levine is the only person that Hannah and Vi really interact with. Lord Wade, Violet's father, hasn't come to visit since a particularly bad attack where Vi had lit almost an entire wall on fire. And her mother, Lady Wade, never visits. But the two girls have each other, and while Hannah does sometimes look out the window and imagine what it would be like to go and explore the world, she once again would never dream of leaving Vi behind. And so Hannah continues to live at Windermere Manor with Vi, continues to talk back to Miss Levine, and more recently, continues to go in search of the handsome new gardener, Jack, any time her and Vi are allowed their walk around the garden. That is, until the day that everything changes. Hannah and Vi are out for a walk in the garden when there's a sudden downpour. They escape from the rain into one of the gardener's shacks, and Hannah ventures back out to get some firewood to light a fire to keep them warm until the storm moves on. However, as she bends down to open the lid of the wood bin, Hannah is suddenly grabbed and a damp cloth is placed over her nose and mouth. It's all right, Lady Violet, says a voice. You'll come to no harm if you cooperate. Before she loses consciousness, Hannah decides that no matter what, she's going to protect her friend to the end and will never admit to this person that they have taken the wrong girl. Hannah wakes up nauseous and confused and in a carriage, traveling quite quickly. She's surprised when she opens her eyes and is met with a young woman about her own age. After asking Hannah Hannah, in the most polite way to please try and refrain from vomiting until after they have arrived at their destination, she introduces herself as Miss Sylvia Langley. And while Miss Langley is the epitome of British manners, she still refuses to tell Hannah where they're going and who exactly kidnapped her. When they do reach their final destination, a huge Gothic mansion with gabled roofs and castellated turrets and towers and chimney stacks, Hannah is shocked to find none other and Jack, the new gardener, waiting for them. He is introduced as Jack Langley, Miss Sylvia's cousin, and assures Hannah once again that no harm will come to her. Welcome, he says, to Frackingham House, or, as it's more commonly called, Sylvia tells her, the Freak House. Hannah soon learns that she's not the only one in the house who's a bit strange. The house is also home to August Langley, Jack and Sylvia's uncle and a literal mad scientist, his mute butler Bollard, Sylvia, and of course, Jack, who is a fire starter, just like Violet. The more time that Hannah is kept at Freak House, she starts to realize that this strange family really does believe that they're doing her a favor in kidnapping her, and truly does seem like they don't actually want anything from her, or more specifically from Lord Wade, who Hannah keeps telling them is not going to pay a ransom for a daughter who he keeps locked in an attic. However, what they are interested in is her power. Well, Violet's power. The power that, as far as Violet and Hannah were concerned, only caused fear, confusion, and Miss Levine to get very, very angry. But Jack and Sylvia see it differently. And they're very interested in helping Hannah learn more about the power and learn how she can control it and focus it and make it stronger. The only problem is it's not Hannah's power. 
it's violets. Or is it? So as I mentioned, The Wrong Girl is the start of the first Freak House trilogy, of which there are three. Each trilogy are connected to each other through the characters and the storylines, but each focus on a different person and a different story kind of connected to this house. Uh, they all involve a supernatural element, some of them more ridiculous than others. The last one, I think, involves someone who can escape into dreams and who somehow manages to bring home a dream warrior into the real world and who she then falls in love with and has to figure out how she can let him go back to the dream world when she is, in fact, in love with him and how she can say goodbye. Yeah. Oh, yes. No, your face is accurate, Corrine. It's 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 a lot. He doesn't uh, have like a social insurance number. Like what? He, how is no, he going to provide? No, he does. He, Corrine. He doesn't even have clothes. <laughs> Social insurance numbers are the least of their concerns. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure he carries a gigantic sword on his back. So <laughs> sheathed in what? Oh, I don't know. It's been a while since I've read that one. So as you probably can tell, they are very much in the romance genre. So if you are not a fan of romance in Virginia, then I would suggest staying far, far away from these books. Um, however ridiculous as they are, I really did love them when I first read them. I, I don't know if they would stand up today. It's been a while since I've read them. But I think that I'm happy to just kind of leave them as as they were in my memory, as these completely ridiculous, but comforting romance paranormal supernatural historical so they're yeah hist paranormal historical romance they got a lot they got a lot so they kind of stack it they pack it all in there um so yeah so if you are looking for something that is maybe a little bit ridiculous um but if you enjoy a good romance if you enjoy a good uh, historical romance with a touch of magic then i would definitely uh, recommend the wrong girl by cj archer um, and really any of cj archer's uh stuff that sounds absolutely bonkers in the best way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's move on to Corrine. Corrine, what do you have for us today? I'm still like slightly haunted by where he's keeping that sword if he doesn't have any clothes on. Like <laughs> might he might have a robe. I'm trying to I just like I said, it's been a while, but there's definitely an issue with trying to find him proper clothing at one point i mean are the straps to sort of hold a sword on your back really clothes yeah maybe he just has like a holster strap to his back <laughs> he's also like not real he's not real he's not a real person is he like someone dreaming and then he gets himself into the dream and then she takes him out of the dream or is he like fully a construct no, I'm pretty sure he's like, they have to, like, he lives in a dream world, so he doesn't live anywhere in the real world. And I, again, it's been a while, so I don't remember exactly kind of what the world is that he lives in. But I know that she does have to, to like, decide whether she's going to send him back to this world. And there's like the the humor of him trying to figure out life in the 19th century. What is all of this stuff that I, yeah. I said, ridiculous. It gets more and more ridiculous. Obviously, it started off in like a base of gritty realism and then, mm, yeah, clearly went into dreams. It's like the Tamora Fire Pierce. starting, completely normal. Completely yeah. normal. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like the Tamora Pierce one where she kind of falls in love. It's a crow that gets turned into a man and then they fall in love. And as like a teenager, it's like, oh, that's fine. And then as an adult, I'm like, <laughs> well, but he's a bird. He's a full bird. He's like a bird with a human skin on. Um, Suspend your disbelief, Kareem. Suspend your disbelief. I don't know if I can. Um, which leads me to my book. Um, I was going to talk about Heaven's Official Blessing, but I actually can't talk about that without breaking into high-pitched laughter. I, I tried. I tried at home. Like, okay, let me just sit down and try to like, blast through this plot I couldn't do it I couldn't do it um so instead I chose something that is not so much a guilty pleasure but it is something that I am guilty of and it's 
not exactly holding my interlibrary loans far, far, far past their due date. Um, it is of when I get interested in a subject or there's something that I really want to know about, instead of, you know, just like learning about that and studying that, I instead turn towards the side road, the little niche of like, oh, but why would we want to actually sit down and learn the language when in fact we could learn how people learn? And then I get very obsessed with that and forget what I was supposed to be doing. And as someone whose brain is a mystery to themselves as well as to the people that they live with, um, I wanted to learn and I'm interested in learning more about kind of neuroscience and like psychology um, and how people learn, because that is very interesting to me. It kind of has no point and it is helping me avoid what I actually need to be doing, which is studying languages. But anyways, um, so I kind of took a look around at different learning methods, different books that are kind of kind of in the same way as Virginia, except not productivity, just learning of like, oh, well, I'll just instead of being productive, I'll just learn how to be productive. Um, and there was one book that kind of came up a couple of times that I thought was quite interesting, mostly because it says that everything that you're doing is wrong. And I was like, well, seems right. Um, so I'm going to talk about the book, Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning. Um, it has three authors, all of them with really great names. Uh, Henry L. Rodiger III, who, according to his Wikipedia article, is nicknamed Roddy, um, who is a leading scientist in kind of memory, but also he has like a side gig in false memories, which I find also fascinating but did not go down that rabbit hole because I was very focused and on a time limit. Um, Mark McDaniel, who is uh, a researcher in cognitive psychology, the retrieval of memory and also perspective memory, which I find very interesting, which is essentially the science of trying to remember to do something, which is someone who struggles with that. I'm like, tell me more, Mark. Tell me more. How do I remember to send an email? How do I remember to take everything that I need from home to work this morning? Give me everything I need, Mark. And then on the other side of things, um, which I'm very thankful for, they bought in a real writer, um, Peter C. Brown, um, who is not the Peter Brown who wrote uh, Mr. Tiger's Day Out, which is a real bummer. Um, he is just an author to kind of put all these different ideas into a readable format, um, because this is quite like a dense neuroscience book made palpable. So how do we learn. If you have an image about it uh, in your head, you're probably thinking of like a late night student with all their books kind of strewn out them, a package of highlighters. Um, they're really focused on their one subject that they're doing, single-mindedly kind of working through all of the math textbook, reading and rereading it, um, repeating all of the things over and over again as they go over, cramming it all in their brain. Um, striving for perfection and not making any mistakes so that it finally sticks. The more you struggle when you're learning, the better you learn, and that is the only way to learn. But is it? According to our authors, no, it's it's very wrong. Um, they have kind of gone through the different uh, psychology and studies and different kind of methodologies through the year of learning how we actually make memories. But making the memories isn't so much the important part. It's being able to retrieve the memories. So um, as I think most of us had to in university or college, we had to study a language. Ostensibly, I think I studied German. Um, can I retrieve a single word of German in a pinch? No. So did I pass German? Yeah, I sure did. Um, and so the authors are kind of saying, yeah, you've made that memory, but if you can't get at it, it's pointless. And all of that studying, all that cramming that you did, all that repetition and the exposure and sitting in the class, de cleansing, declining, whatever I was doing with those German verbs, um, was all kind of pointless. And I invested a lot of highlighters that wasn't necessarily useful. Um, so they kind of really look into how memories are formed and then how we can make it easy to retrieve them. 
because we are actually really poor judges of our abilities and what we know, which is a terrifying thought. And so if we want to be the most effective in our learning, instead of just kind of having the illusion of learning, um, there are some methods and some some different strategies and things that we can do to actually help us learn correctly. And they really go against what you probably have the inclination or instinct to do, which I thought was really interesting. Um, so to kind of boil this whole book down into what could have been a pamphlet, um, essentially what you need to do is quiz yourself. <laughs> That's the only way you're going to learn how to do it um, is the you need to stretch out the time between when you learn something and then you quiz it and then there's a period of time and then you quiz yourself on it again because what's actually important is not the making of the memory it's being able to grab it when you need it and apply it which makes sense um but you don't want to just reread it because you think you know it when you read it because you're reading it and it's in front of you but if the book is closed and you're actually just trying to grab it out of your brain that is actually building those links that you need to be able to have it there when you need it. Um, he's also talking, they also talk about instead of kind of like a single minded focus on one thing, you should actually study multiple things at the same time, switch between them, focus on one thing and then focus on another thing and then focus on another thing and try to build the links between them because our brain, um, as they say, is not a muscle. Um, you can't just work entire brain and then entire brain works. Whatever part you work will work really well. And then the rest of it is going to forget what those little symbols on the laundry tags mean. Um, unless you continually retrieve that and try to remember that you probably shouldn't put those really expensive pants into the washing machine, but you did and it's too late. And so now you have to live with that. Um, you should kind of uh, reflect on what you've learned after you study it. So just kind of think about it, try to explain it to yourself in your own words, focus on big concepts and not little things. Um, again, like it was very interesting. Um, I think what was the most interesting part of this book, um, other than, you know, the tips and tricks that, you know, make sense is that when people were explained to this and they went through studies that said, hey, don't reread things and highlight things because it's actually pointless. And, you know, they went through this study with these students and showed them, oh, you know, you actually learn better and you got higher scores when you just quizzed yourself. And they were like, yes, yes, that makes total sense. They went back to those same students months later and lo and behold, they were back to highlighting and rereading and refused to do what they had actually been shown to be more effective and got them higher grades which is just so fascinating. These ideas of what studying should be like and what learning looks like are so embedded in us that even when we are shown ample evidence to the contrary, we just can't let them go. And I get it because I love highlighters. I love highlighters. Um, but I mostly love them for their colors and they are not going to get you effectively fluent in the language that you need to be in 28 days. So if you are interested in kind of learning more about learning, if you again like to go down the side roads before you actually kind of get back onto that main highway of your destination, I would recommend reading chapter eight of Make It Stick. Uh, which is a great summary of all that you really kind of need from this book. Um, the rest of it is fine. Peter C. Brown does a great job, but it would have been a lot better with more tigers. Um, but yeah, if you're just kind of looking for something like that, if like me, um, you, you would like your brain to sometimes just work a little bit better so that you didn't forget your laundry in the washer for three weeks, this book might be for you. Um, yeah, make it stick uh, and uh, make Roddy proud. Was it the pair of pants that you weren't supposed to put in the washer, the ones that you left there for three weeks? No, those ones are trash beyond all recognition. Oh, <laughs> like, no. done. Done. I put, the, I, I like, and I put them in the dryer too because, like, who cares um, at that point? And then I was like, what? It, why are they this texture? I don't pants <laughs> and our clothing are supposed to be this texture. Um, and by then it was far too late. Well, thank you, Corrine, that as someone who is also trying to learn a language, like, 
learning those new sort of ways to test yourself and actually retain information is very valuable. I may go back to my highlighting as well, but we'll see. So our final book today is mine. And like Sadie, I struggled between two different series um, that I wanted to talk about. Um, both of them are decades spanning series involving vampires. Um, so today's book is the first of a decade spanning series that I may or may not own over 20 volumes of in ebook form. I may have mentioned this in other another episode, but one of my greatest guilty pleasures is vampire media. I love vampire media in all forms. I love modern paranormal romance. I love historical detective novels. I love classic horror novels. And of course, I love this. So Vampire Hunter D, if I can get my phone to show on this screen, you can't see it very well, is a series of novels by Japanese author Hideyuki Kikuchi, illustrated by Yoshitaka Amano of Final Fantasy fame. The first volume was published in 1983, and the current ongoing story, according to Wikipedia, began serialization in December 2022. In Japanese, there are 40 novels spread over 52 volumes, while so far in English, there are 24 novels spread over 29 volumes, with the 30th set to come out next year. The genre of these books is a little hard to pin down. Set in the year 12,090, we find humanity scraping by with remnants of advanced technology after nuclear war annihilated human civilization in the far distant year of 1999. Monsters of all sorts have arisen from this irradiated period, but some have also been genetically bred by vampires, or, as they style themselves, the nobility, who are biding their time underground with advanced technology and possibly also magic, waiting for humanity to destroy itself so that they could rise. So it might seem as though the series is a post-apocalyptic science fiction dystopia, aside from the fact that vampires simply exist unquestioned. While the other monsters from myth and legend, werewolves, dragons, mist devils, and more, are explained away as genetically modified creatures or radiation-spawned monstrosities, vampires are simply assumed to have existed before humanity destroyed itself waiting to take over. They were just there. We do not question this. While humanity in the year 12,090 is no longer completely under the thumb of the nobility, they still fear them, however. And this, as well as the plethora of other monsters that humans have to defend themselves from, have spawned the capital H Hunters. Hunters specialize in particular types of monsters. And of course, the most skilled and the most feared, and the ones who command the highest prices, are the Vampire Hunters. And this brings me to my thesis about this series. While it seems on the surface a mashup of fantasy, science fiction, horror, and post-apocalyptic dystopia, from a narrative perspective, there's only one genre that this series most resembles, and that, my friends, is a Western. Let me give you an overview of what I mean. In the classic Western, our hero rides into a frontier town or outlying farm, finding it under threat by bandits or, more racistly, by Native Americans, and often, but not always, finds a beautiful young woman in need of saving. Facing threats within and without the town, their fighting skills are put to the test, but in the end they succeed at driving away the threat. They might be offered a place to stay amongst the people they have saved, but reject this invitation in favor of continuing onward to the next adventure. Now, let me broadly summarize the first Vampire Hunter D book. Our hero D is a wandering hunter. He wanders the wasteland on his cyborg horse, curved sword over his shoulder, until he comes across a beautiful young woman named Doris, under threat from the vampire Count Magnus Lee, the local noble living on, and she lives on an outlying farm near the frontier town of Rancilva. Facing threats from within the town, including the mayor's son Greco-Roman, yes, that is his name, who has his lecherous eye on Doris, even though she hates him, and other hunters passing through, as well as the vampiric threat outside, Dee's fantastic fighting skills are put to the test, but in the end, he succeeds in driving away the threat, and the town-slash-farm-slash-beautiful young woman is saved. He might be able to find a home in this town now that he's proven himself, overcoming the fear that people feel at the presence of an outsider like him, but he does not choosing instead to wander onwards towards the next adventure. Of course, it's more complicated than this simple formula, but the Western influence is clear. 
I also need to point something else out about D. He is definitely what some in the world of fandom might call a Mary Sue or a Gary Stu character. He is or appears to be a youth of no more than 17 or 18, but he is an incredibly skilled fighter, able to best veteran fighters and supernatural beings with seeming ease. He's also a Dampier, half vampire himself, which seems to give him many of the advantages of being a vampire and few of the disadvantages. And it is an ongoing mystery within the series whether or not his vampiric father may have been. No, it can't be. A legendary vampire whose name also begins with D? Hmm? Finally, and this can't be stressed enough, D is pretty. D is so incredibly, ethereally, otherworldly pretty that other characters and the narrative itself pause to comment on it frequently. But of course, he's also a very chaste hero, aloof in demeanor and set apart from the people around him, even keeping his composure when, say, a young woman strips naked in front of him to try and distract him while she attacks him with a werewolf hair whip, which happens in the first chapter of this book. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think I may have given some ideas as to why this series falls on the guilty part of guilty pleasure for me. <laughs> but why do I love it? Honestly, the world building is fantastic, and the writing is sumptuous and atmospheric. The art by Yoshitaka Amano has an ethereal quality to it that just pulls you in. And the stories are fun, fairly quick reads. The lore, of course, gets more complicated over the course of this series, but that's just part of the fun. Plus, of course, it's vampire me media, and as mentioned before, I love vampire media. If you're a fan of the anime Trigun, there's definitely some similarity in the post-apocalyptic sci-fi western tone of the series, and you might enjoy that. If you're looking for something with vampires, but that's a little bit different from the everyday vampire fare out there, it's something to consider picking up. And if you want a somewhat pulpy genre mashup that just happens to have vampires in it, you would definitely enjoy this series. So that is Vampire Hunter D by Yoshitaka Amano. And that is all we have for today. That is our guilty pleasures. So what is your guilty pleasure? What do you like to read, but maybe not recommend and maybe consider recommending it? It's a lot of fun. And like Virginia said, reading should never be something you feel guilty about. So thank you everyone for joining us. This has been Keep It Fictional, the book podcast from Port Moody Public Library, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.